Welcome to Real Scoop Live, a show for pool chemistry enthusiasts where we talk about all the coolest chemistry stuff you never knew you wanted to know. Any chemical advice or suggestions are opinion and utilized at the discretion of each individual pool operator. With that out of the way, let's start the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Real Scoop Live. This is Season 2, Episode 6. And with me today are Matt and Brett, and they're going to talk to you about pool add-ons and alternatives. I don't really know if it's episode six, but we're, we're sure are recording it, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be six, seven, eight, whatever you want it to be. I, you can put them up whatever order you want, right? Yeah, yeah. C- yeah. Call it good. So in other words, this is another episode of RSL. That's Hello. right. Season two, RSL. Thank you for being here. Today, we're going to talk about add-ons and alternatives um, because there seems to be, at least in the last in the last maybe 10 years or so, um, an idea that people want to get away from traditional ways of taking care of pools, either, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they want to make things more healthy. Maybe they want to make things more holistic. You know, maybe they want to get away from chlorine, maybe they're dealing with uh, allergies from their, you know, from their swimmers, from their kids or whatever. Some or maybe they just want to do something better for the environment. Some right? people just like new toys too. Well, that's true. That's I want to try something new. Why? Because it's new. Okay, so I want to point out when we're talking about these things that the two thing, the two little O uh, fart clouds there. Uh, oh. That we'll we'll get to that. Those those it's something different than what it looks like. I mean, but, that's that's appropriate to have the O in there though. <laughs> oh, that that really looks like a pool pudding. Anyway, okay, so we're going to talk about a whole bunch of add-ons and alternatives. We're going to try to make this as succinct as possible. Remember, if you have been following us throughout the, the last season and a half, that sometimes we get we go off in tangents. But uh, that's also the comments that we get about the things that people like. So we're trying to keep it tighter. Yes, but not so tight that it's a yeah right. Then have to be a grueling pace. Right. Okay, so let's. Uh, you want to talk about these, or we got them? We got them in the in the show. Oh, they're, they're on the show. Them. Let's go to the next one. All right. So one of the alternatives that, that a lot of people have have been going to for maybe about the last fifteen to twenty years is metals and mineral systems. As far as the actual mineral systems, they've been available since the beginning of uh, right at the late late nineteen nineties into the early two thousands. The copper and silver algae side has actually been around for decades and decades. So. When you talk about metals and minerals, there are a lot of benefits for having certain minerals and certain metals in the water. One of them is, especially with the copper algicides and the silver algicides, is that those are very effective algicides. So they actually kill algae very well. The silver algicide is a little bit different than the copper. It is more expensive nowadays, and it's harder to find because copper is more expensive. So silver. silver, I mean, sorry, silver is more expensive. Yeah, it's, look, right now, everything's more expensive, but- Silver is more expensive than copper, but silver is actually a bacteria side. So along uh, along the way, as it's killing bacteria, it also kills algae. Where copper algae side only kills algae, it doesn't kill bacteria. So um, what a lot of people have some worries about that kind of thing is that, you know, when you put a silver or a copper into the water, it tends to stay in the water. So if that builds up, then you can have problems with high pH or high chlorine causing staining. So that's why that's why then they went to other mineral systems or metal systems, i.e. like the ones that are shown where uh, there are canisters that contain either cer- you know, ceramic balls or balls of um, copper or iron that are literally stay in the container. So you get the ions, you get the, the use of that copper, but the copper stays inside of the container. And the container gets changed out every four to six months, depending on the container you get, the system you have, all the other stuff. It's kind of interesting too, because the like like Matt said, this isn't new technology. Uh, mm-hmm. There was research papers in the fifties where they tested at university pools using silver mineral in the water, uh, and they noticed uh, a lot a lot of improvements in terms of um, chemi- additional chemicals that they had to use. They had to use less of them, um, less uh, chances for algae outbreaks and things like that. So. Um, Good technology, been around a long time. Just people found a different way to package it and get it into the pool. So different delivery systems and different ways to keep the metals in check uh, so that they don't cause further problems down the road. 
in the last 10 years, they actually came out with the triple chelated copper algaecide too, which that triple chelation means that it actually is more, if you think about it like a, uh, it only releases itself when there's algae present. And so that stuff can actually be protected against a lot of the normal changes in water chemistry and the normal use of, of pool chemicals to actually stay in that water for up to 90 days or up to three months. But the thing about it is, is that when you're thinking about that, that means best case scenario, you're going to have an algaecide in the water for 90 days. Worst case scenario is if you put in a, a 90 day or a long life extended use algaecide and you have a lot of algae in the water right now, it actually uses up that capability. So don't think when you're going into a 90 day algaecide that's going to last for 90 days because it all depends on how much algae was in there now and how much algae gets in there between now and day 90. So it it's, might last 30 days. It might last 15 days or it might last, might last 90 days. It's almost kind of like a, a 90 day uh, expiration date algaecide where you put it in. It could potentially be there for 90 days, just like your milk. Technically, it'll be OK till October 31st. But if you drink it all on the 10th, it's not going to make it all the way to the 31st. There's this really sloppy okay. analogy, but there's, there's something I, I get, there to work I get what with. you mean now yeah. because you, like, you were kind of huh? going like this and you came back like that. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. It's sloppy. We can work that one out in post. Yes, but we won't. <laughs> so like, like what Matt was saying, uh, depending on the mineral blend in there, it can help prevent algae, bacteria, biofilm, uh, depending on what the blend of metals that are in there. Uh, they help to reduce the need for ancillary troubleshooting chemicals because they're helping to prevent some of the issues that you would need the troubleshooting chemicals for. And they also take secondary tasks off the primary sanitizer. Now, Matt, what would be a couple of the secondary tasks that would come off of your primary sanitizer? Well, you know what? I'll answer that question, but I'm sitting here wondering what a primary sanitizer is. Well, let's for those make viewing it at home. Let's make it short. Chlorine. Okay. So primary sanitizer would be a halogen-based product, mainly chlorine, but you can also think of bromine because they're both halogens. But for the most part, you're talking about chlorine. So chlorine is a primary sanitizer. So what kind of tasks can having a metal or mineral system do? Well, it can actually make your chlorine last longer because it's helping to dissipate and kill some of the bacteria and the algae that would normally take chlorine to kill it. So if you don't have to use as much chlorine, that means that you can actually shorten or say lengthen the life between between shocking, um, that also means you can use less chlorine. So if you have uh, kids or swimmers that are chlorine, should I say chlorine resistant? Intolerant. That are, that chlorine <laughs> intolerant, um, then, then it actually makes the water feel nicer. So, and, that, and you know, one other thing too, is that we're talking about that depending on the metals with the algae, bacteria, and biofilm, each one of these, these metal and mineral systems actually have different makeups, right? Most of the time they have they have copper infused balls, um, typically ceramic balls, but not necessarily ceramic balls, but there's copper. There's typically um, silver in some of them. There's also zinc in some of them, which is really good for mold and mildew. And then there's also nickel, which is really good for uh, mold and mildew as well. So, you know, you have, you have typically those four, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like eating Mexican food. You know, you have four, Four ingredients, you just mix them up in different things or put them in a different tortillas and you have something different, right? Yeah. Well, that's how it is with these. They're all about the same, but they are a little bit different. So if you are specifically worried about mold as opposed to silver, as opposed to algaecide, or if you or you're worried about bacteria, make sure that when you're asking either the vendor or the pool store that you're going to, which one has the most silver, right? Or which one has the most copper, that kind of thing. All right. Here's another fun one. Ozone systems. Who remembers the ozone hole? The ozone layer. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Ozone. It's an unstable molecule, a combination of oxygen molecules. The instability of it, the instability of it is what makes it a good oxidizer where it can break down contaminants in the water. So think of it as a brick wall. Your contaminant is the brick wall. The ozone is kind of like a, um, what am I thinking? The construction equipment with the big ball that swings. Wrecking ball. A wrecking ball. Your, your, your ozone a song. is a wrecking ball that's breaking down that wall uh, bit by bit. That's that's kind of a neat way to think about it. So you're, you're just breaking it down to its base components. Once it's down to the bricks, then you can filter it out or get rid of it that way. Um, uh, one neat part about ozone, it's, it's very strong, um, but it doesn't treat 
the water that's in the pool, it only treats the water as it's passing through the ozonator. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So if you if, think of it, think of like chlorine, you put chlorine in the water, it dissolves in the water and it's actually equalizing out so that generally the whole pool has relatively the same amount of chlorine in it. Ozone doesn't do that because it dissipates too rapidly. It doesn't maintain a residual in the water. So it's only treating that small bit of water that's passing through the ozonator as it's going through there. Um, we, we call that a point of contact kill. That's right. Point of contact kill. Oh. So that's great if you can get all the water in the pool through that ozonator in a, in a certain amount of time. But the problem is, is, as many of you know that are watching, that what happens essentially is, is that you'll have a pool that was designed kind of wonky or that has a dirty filter or that has a main drain that's closed or a whole bunch of other things that cause hydraulic messes. And if that's the case, or even if you have a pool that doesn't have much swimmers, and if they, have, if they don't have a main drain or they have a blocked main drain, then essentially you're recycling in top 18 inches of water. So you have this other, you know, two or three feet or even six feet that's not getting treated. So essentially for an ozonator, and, and we're, not, we're not talking bad about ozonators, it's just something to think about, is that unless you get that whole body of water through that ozonator at a relatively quick enough time to kill the pathogens in the water, you don't ever really kill all the pathogens in the water. That's why this is called a secondary, a secondary oxidizer, secondary sanitizer, not a primary. It's like what we've said in other, other episodes. Uh, the pool is not just chemistry, <clears throat> equipment, surface. It's everything working together. And if you've got one thing out of whack, it can throw off other components that you wouldn't even think of. Um, so hydraulics are a big one. Equipment's a big one, making sure you've got proper sizing and things are installed correctly. It all comes into play. So yeah, not, not putting any, any one system program part or piece down over another. We're just saying, be aware of it because there have been quite a few pools built that uh, have questionable hydraulics. And I just uh, want to point out that Brett said, be aware of it, not beware of it. Be aware of it. Okay. That's right. Now, what about humidity, Matt? Oh, well, here's the here's the fun fact, the trivial fact that uh, maybe not a lot of people know about. The higher the humidity, the less effective the ozonator is. So if you live in an area that has very high humidity that's happening all the time, your ozonator is not as effective as it should be or could be. And sometimes, depending on the humidity, it can actually not be effective at all. So make sure to take that into consideration. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you can uh, consult the MAC, which is the MAHC. Uh, which is kind of like a, not really a Bible, but it's something that let you know what kind of, what kind of things you can use and can't use on at least commercial pools, but what goes for commercial goes for residential in a sense. Ultraviolet light. Now, are we just talking about really rad purple? No, no. Mm -mm. What's, what's ultraviolet light? <laughs> it's it's <laughs> certainly not something that comes from a flashlight like Bill here. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so UV light is a specialized wavelengths of light that's capable of neutralizing contaminants. So it works a lot like an ozonator does, except instead of, a, instead of generating ozone, it just does it with, a, with certain bands of light or certain wavelengths of light. And so essentially what happens is, is that when these pathogens, instead of going through an ozonator and getting doused with ozone, these pathogens go over a light bulb and the light bulb then would kill the, would kill the pathogens. So with the, with the advent of the COOF, you've probably seen a lot more things in your everyday life, especially with, uh, with mass, tr mass transit that has UV light that is killing different pathogens. It's the same style of thing, except it's made for your pool. So when the water comes through, it, it, uh, it disrupts those pathogens, renders them inert. And then that way, um, you don't have the pathogens hurting you or your kids or all the other things that you know, pathogens do in pool water. And just like Rusting ozone out. systems, it's a point of contact. So as the water's passing mm. past the, the UV light bulb, that is the water that's getting treated. The UV light doesn't shine into the pool. Um, it doesn't do anything like that. It's just treating the oh, water. Man, but that would be cool. Through. That would be really cool. It'd be cool, pretty though. neat, but it'd be like, uh, I just picture somebody hooking up a microwave to the side of the pool. And you're like, well, this is how we heat it up, too. Don't do that, anyone. You know um, you know what they should do? And and I won't, I won't take any... Any credit for this, unless you make a lot of money. And if you do, you can just send me a couple, couple, you know, percentages of it. Some shekels. But what would happen if they if they made um, pool lights instead of using LED lights, they would use ultraviolet lights. So that way, whenever your pool light was on, shined all through it. Then that way, 
it would kill I everything in the pool. I think everyone would have really, really, really bad sunburns after they got out of the pool. Oh, well, I mean, that might be an upgrade. I mean, right? for the certain clientele. You can swim and tan, and the water's clean. <laughs> not bad. Not bad. There's anyway, bones, okay. There's, there's bones there we can work with. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, especially if they're in there for a long time. Okay. <laughs> a- AOP. AOP is A-O-P. Actually, actually kind of a combination of both UV and ozone. Um, as uh, you generate ozone, as it passes through a UV system, it actually creates hydroxyl radicals. Those are the little O oh, farts that are attacking the pathogens in there. Um, it's, it's, it's an unstable molecule that actually uh, helps to break those things down uh, pretty efficient, pretty fast, um, actually faster than either one of the other ones um, separately. So kind of neat. Also, point of contact system so just as the water's passing through the system is where the aop or advanced oxidation potential is actually doing most of its work now if you've noticed oxidation has been a common theme through a lot of these because it helps to break down stuff in the water that you don't want in the water Uh, ultimately if you can pull the stuff out of the water or break it down to the point where it gases off or can filter out you're saving yourself a lot of time later on down the road so oxidation comes into play a lot when you're talking about um secondary programs, systems, products, um, and ways to get, get more out of your pool and your systems. Um, that's the now, quick and now, qu- Before quick we and go dirty. to the next, the next screen, let's, let's look at this for a second. But in the italicized green area, it says AOP systems must be sized correctly and are often installed with a bypass loop. That is the same as the UV systems and ozone systems. All of these things, since they are a point of contact kill, you have to have the pathogens go through that are a certain speed if they go too slow, then obviously everything you know kind of gets wonky because the, the system isn't working as effectively as it could. But if they go too fast, they're not there long enough to get, um, Broken to get down. rendered inert, right? Yeah. So that's why you know hydraulics, like we talked about before, is such a big thing when you're using these, these external models. Is that because those things have to have enough time to do their job? And if they have too much time, they overdo it. And if they have too little time, they don't do it at all. So it's very important that all that stuff is, is, uh, let's, let's go back to the kitchen installed. reference. We're going to get away from the milk, but it's the Thanksgiving Turkey this time. If you leave the Turkey in the oven too long, you completely burn it and you don't get any use out of that bird. Uh, you pull it out when it's still raw. You can still have some critters in there that are going to make you sick. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Uh-huh. We'll, we'll keep working on the kitchen references. I think we got something here. When we talk about calcium. I got a great one. <laughs> okay, so ozone, UV, and AOP are all kind of grouped together. It all depends on what you want to do. Like Brett said, AOP is a combination of ozone and UV, but all three of them work together to inactivate harmful pathogens that are chlorine resistant, which is really great because what you do not know or what you may not know is that there are pathogens that get into pools that will not be killed by chlorine at a normal rate, right? Some of them are anywhere between 25 parts per million to 30, 40, 50 parts per million. And sometimes, like in the case of cryptosporidium, you're talking about 50 parts per million for multiple days. And you know how hard it is to have 50 parts per million of chlorine in a pool for multiple days in order to kill cryptosporidium, which is a waterborne illness that can cause all kinds of nasty issues. It's it's pretty bad. So having something, especially if you're a germaphobe or you have someone that, you know, that, that um, swims in your pool a lot that doesn't have great hygiene, having an ozone UV or an AOP system is, is a pretty good idea. I just picture you, old Stinky Pete's coming by later to swim in the pool again. You better kick on the AOP system. <laughs> old Stinky Pete's coming. Um, one uh, one final little gadget or gizmo that we want to talk about briefly. This one's really kind of specific for saltwater pools. Um, saltwater creates a little bit more of a harsher environment just because of the characteristics of salt that's in the water. Um, sacrificial anode, it's giving itself up for the benefit of the other metallic pieces in the water. So instead of the salt water, think of of, it as a mean thing that wants to take things from you. It wants to take metal from your pool heater, from your, from your pump impeller, from anything, from your handrails, anything metal that's in the water, it wants to take it. Well, the sacrificial anode, he's just a good guy. He's a good Samaritan. He comes in here and he stands in front of the salt water and says, Hey bro, come at me. (laughs) And so the salt water says, Okay. And he just takes 
metal ions off the zinc anode because it's sacrificial. It actually is easier for the salt water to take metal off of that than it is the other parts of pool equipment. So this technology has been around for a while. They actually use it on large ocean vessels. They put it on there so that it'll attack the zinc on the ship versus destroying the steel hull because that's a heck of a lot more expensive to, to repair or replace uh, than just putting some some zinc slugs on the side there. So same kind of thing, uh, but it can save you a boatload of time, effort, boatload. and load. See, pretty hip crowd today. Um, so yeah, it it saves the other pieces down the line so that they don't get broken down prematurely. Now, did we go over all of the gizmos out there today? Absolutely not. But we're trying to keep it tighter. Um, there's there's other things out there that can can definitely help. Oh, hey, look, this is a subtle plug here for from Papa Parent Company. Um, yeah. <laughs> Easy Pool is a blended product. It does multiple things. It's an oxidizer. Hey, there's that word again, oxidizer. It's an algicide. Hey, that's that word again, algicide. It's a stain and scale, clarifier, balancers, all in one bucket. Uh, it helps a boatload of different ways. Um, I didn't want to get into commercial time, but there there we go. I, I well, you know, the thing is that we were talking there. about alternatives. And I said to Brett, I said, well, don't you think that Easy Pool is an alternative? Well, let's throw it up there, right? Because... This, this is a way to get out of the traditional taking care of the pools to reduce the amount of ancillary chemicals that you have to store and use and 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 dose and with fuss and, over and swim in and fuss over and get confused about and all that stuff. This is something you can do that literally it's about a chlorine tablet per 10,000 gallons a week and a pound of easy pool per 10,000 gallons per week. And everything's taken care of. Yep. So it's a great alternative. So anyway, that's it. That's it. That's all we right? got. We appreciate you being here uh, for our one of the episodes from season two, add-ons and alternatives. Yeah, we, we're thinking around six. Yeah, around Should six. Be. Should, Should be, be six. So like, share, and subscribe if you can. Hit notifications if you like us. And if you don't, that's fine. Thanks for being here. And thanks for listening this long. We appreciate it, you. If you've got chemical issues that you want talked about, hit us up. We, we love that because that's actually where we get a lot of these ideas from is yes. from talking to people out in the field. So please yell at us and let us know. Have a lovely day. Do, do you really think that we would have brought up sacrificial anodes unless someone said, hey, can you talk about sacrificial anodes? Probably. I mean, kind of. But that's just <laughs> I don't we are. usually have a lot to, to contribute to our chemical talks, but I would like to say when you were talking about the ozone layer, I actually helped to the depletion of the ozone layer with some pretty radical hairstyles back in oh. the 80s. I, so, I was Matt did I too. Wanted to, I just wanted to bring that full circle. So you see, I yeah. was when he was saying that I was thinking of I was thinking bring up hairnet, bring up hairnet. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And right guard in the spray, right? Right. My my way older brothers used to tell me about the stuff that you could spray. The, back in the 80s. Right, right. The right. the aerosol yeah. ha hairspray was just potato cannon fuel for me. <laughs> yes. Yep. It, all that contributed to it. Mm -hmm. Well, so. in fun fact about easy pull, it's good for your hair and skin. So it won't be like a <laughs> hey, look at that. Well, so that's we because just, of yeah, it's all it's all here. It's I feel it's so all happy about oxygen and water. Yep. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.